I'm William O'Neill. I was born on June the 6th, 1927, in Ottawa, Canada. I'm a child of the Depression during the 1930s. I have some memories of that. Everything changed in 1939 because of the war. I was quite young and just started to high school. So that um, in 1945, when the war in Europe was about to finish, I was turning 18, the time that I was contemplating going into the military service. And, uh, but because uh, my birthday was after the war was over, I decided and my family persuaded me not to, to enlist. There was really no point in it then. The Japanese war was, was also about to end. So I, uh, made, I had completed my high school education with quite good marks. So I was ready to go to university. In order to, f to, to fund this during the war, uh, I worked on an, uh, an experimental farm, which was just outside the city of Ottawa, and we brought in the first rapeseed oil. I was working for 23 cents an hour, 10 hours a day, uh, six days a week. So I conducted enough money to pay for my first year's tuition at university. I went to Carleton College in Ottawa where they had the first year engineering. Then I went to the University of Toronto for the next three years and graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Engineering as a civil engineer. I had the degree. I didn't have a job. I had worked each summer during my university years. One summer I, I worked with a survey party uh, on the Gatineau River, the Otto River in that area, and got a great deal of, of practical experience, which stood me in good stead for the rest of my life, really. So uh, I wondered what I was going to do, um, found out that there was a position uh, opening up in the Canadian Canals Service. And in those days, we were looking forward to building the St. Lawrence Seaway. So I thought it would be a good place for me to start off and uh, I obtained a position as an engineer in training. I was in Ottawa at this time, spent a month or so there working in the headquarters. I was then shipped to the Niagara Peninsula on the Welland Canal, which was a relatively new canal that had opened in 1931. So there were a lot of bugs still there from the opening that we had to work out, and it was a very good experience for me. When I arrived in the Welland Canal, it had been staffed by people who had built the canal. I'm talking now about the electricians and the, the labor force and so on, and most of them had been in the First World War. So they were mature people. I was 22, quite young. The whole Welland Canal is there to overcome Niagara Falls. It takes ships from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie and bypasses Niagara Falls. The canal was set up into two divisions for operations. The chap in charge of the southern division, which was the Lake Erie end, had had a heart attack and they had to put someone to run this division. I was selected to make my way out of my little room in St. Catharines, Ontario and go to a place called Port Colburn, which was close to Buffalo in the States. And I took over this job. So in the evenings I had nothing to do, so I would go down to the to the canal and go on the vertical lift ridges and I take it up and take it down and seat it without smashing it into the ground. So I got a very good reputation on the canals. I went through the locks in the middle of winter because they were all unwa unwatered at that time for maintenance purposes. So I knew the canal from the bottom up. Then I was asked to go to Montreal to become the assistant resident engineer on an open cut tunnel project across the old Lachine Canal right in the center of the city of Montreal which was a terrific experience, again, for me as a young engineer. So then uh, the seaway was starting about 1954. So we had completed the tunnel. Our group was selected to go and work on the seaway. I led a team who were establishing the basic survey points in the Montreal area and through into the first lock area and so on. I did this. I waited in the river in the summer taking cross sections. I climbed up on an overhead bridge to put up the center line for the seaway. And I did all of these things that were necessary to start this project off. When the, uh, the seaway was started, it was really designed to overcome the old canal system from Montreal to Lake Ontario. 
The largest ships that could go through that canal were about 230 feet in length. The new ships that were going to use the seaway were 715 feet and broader and deeper. So I was uh, invited by my superiors to go back to the Welland Canal and to take on the responsibilities as the division engineer, one of six division engineers in the seaway system. During my uh, time as a civil engineer on the uh, Welland Canal, it became necessary for me to uh, put this uniform on uh, to look at an underwater uh, structure which we were going to blast beside. I wasn't getting good reports from the, from the divers as to precisely what the condition was, so they convinced me that I should look at it myself, which I did. Quite an experience for an inexperienced person to go down 40 feet underwater with lead weights, lead boots, and a couple of divers who enjoyed pumping me full of air. Now when the seaway opened, there was a great inrush of ocean-going ships and they, they were able to get through the new St. Lawrence Seaway section but they got caught on the Welland Canal because it had limited capacity and at one time there were 50-60 ships anchored in Lake Ontario waiting to get through the canal. Ocean ships had come from all over the world to experience the new seaway. It was the highway to the center of North America about 1963 or so, the new seaway was there, functioning fine. The Welland Canal was a stumbling block. The seaway said, well, we've got to do something about this. We'd made the feasibility study. It was accepted and approved. And we proceeded to expropriate the land for the new canal. This is linked in now with a separate problem on the Welland Canal, and that is in the level from the lock which gets you up above the Lake Ontario level and above the Niagara Falls level. The level then went flat across about 8 or 10 miles to Lake Erie at one level, but it ran right through the center of the city of Welland. It had vertical lift bridges, it was twisty and windy, it had railway swing bridges, and it was a real obstruction to navigation. So as a part of the future major expansion of the locks, the Seaway Authority of the day decided, based on our feasibility study, to rebuild an eight mile long section of the canal and move it out of the city of Welland. I said, okay, I'll do this, but we will not have any bridges. We had to move a river, and I said, we're going to do that successfully. The Welland River was crossing the new alignment. We built several tunnels, a railway tunnel, which was huge. Then, my boss at that time was the president of the Seaway, and I was a Seaway uh, officer. Uh, he, had, he had moved over to take over a position in the Department of Transport in Ottawa as the Marine Administrator. The Department of Transport in Canada was being restructured, and it was going to end up with, with um, an air section, a land section, which was railways and roads where the, the federal responsibility existed, and canals and ports. So that was taking place. So my, the president of the Seaway became the marine administrator. Well, he found out he, apparently that he had a problem in what was called the marine services, which was everything except the National Harbors Board ports, the railways, and the Seaway. So he was going to be the, the man over this whole thing. So he had a problem with the marine services segment, which was lighthouses and ice breaking and all aids to navigation, uh, telecommunications for shipping, everything that was outside of the seaway and the ports, the major ports. And he was having a trouble with having some problems with the leadership of that. So he asked me to come, asked me, I use that term a couple of times here, I've been invited to take jobs, but you know when you're being told to do them or not. So I, I in, in 19, uh, 1971, I, I was uh, appointed Assistant Deputy Minister in charge of the Marine Services. I now had to go from British Columbia to Newfoundland and from the Great Lakes the border to the Arctic. That was a mandate for the marine services. And I could see that we could make efficiencies by doing some combining. 
and not having the ships only do the ships and worry about the ships and not have the buoy people and the ace navigation people over here and so on. So I said, the way out of this, I think, is to set up a Coast Guard. I looked at the American system, which is a military arrangement, and I said, we don't want a military arrangement in Canada. I believe that the interface between the Coast Guard and the shipping industry should be civil. So I, I couldn't sell this, I knew, uh, as Bill O'Neill. So I got the famous McKinsey in, and they fortunately confirmed that what I wanted to do was the right thing to do. So in 1975, we started the Canadian Coast Guard. I was the first commissioner of the Coast Guard. We had to give the head some title. It was a bit difficult to select one. In Canada, the, the term commissioner is used for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the commissioner of the RCMP is the top man. So I said, well, we'll use the term commissioner. And this is what we did. The ships were engaged in boy tending and ice breaking in the St. Lawrence River and any in the Great Lakes when required. We also looked after the Arctic resupply. The dew line was a big thing in those days because it was a defense mechanism against the threat from Russia and it was manned by the Americans. But we were responsible for providing all of the supplies for the dew line that could be taken in by ship in a short period during um, about July, the end of July to September. That's when the, the Arctic was essentially free of ice. I used to go to the Arctic for the two-week period all the summer. I made eight, eight to ten trips to the Arctic. We were engaged in the providing of safety arrangements for shipping. In that period of time, just as a matter of interest, the Chinese had decided to join the IMO. They had not been involved previously. So about 1973, I'm, I think it's about right, China came into the IMO. In, in, the, in the sequence of seating in IMO, it was Canada, China. So we got to know the Chinese delegations quite well. And because Canada had diplomatic relations through all of the period of time, with the Chinese, and a famous Canadian, a Dr. Bethune, had looked after the Chinese during their difficult periods. He became a figure known throughout the whole of China, and he still is today. So we had a good relationship with the Chinese. We assisted them to understand a bit more about, about IMO, and personally we got along very well with them. So uh, that was a very good relationship that we, that we, had, we developed. And that's continued to this day for me personally. We're now into the period of between 75 and 80, let's say, where the Canadian Coast Guard is now functioning the way I've described it. We have established our place. I made one mistake that I will own up to, many that I will not own up to, although I have made many, and that is that I did not insist on having the law changed to create the Canadian Coast Guard in its new structure with the legal parliamentary support. I should have done that because it was operating as if it was in, the, in that kind of a category, but there were some internal politics in the Department of Transport that didn't, wasn't worthwhile fighting about. In this period, of course, after the Second World War, Canada came from one of the first naval merchant navies in the world because of all of the ships that were built to carry goods to, the, to Europe. And they were selling all of those ships. And, and that was done by, by one of my predecessors in marine services. And, and, you know, the Greeks then got into shipping by buying Canadian ships. So now we're to 75, we have the Coast Guard there, I'm the commissioner. The St. Lawrence Seaway's president was retiring. And they were looking for a new president for the Seaway. So this is an appointment that is made by the government. It's not a civil service appointment. I was in a civil service position as the commissioner of the Canadian Coast Guard. So now they came to me and said, we'd like you to be the president of the Seaway. So again, I accepted the invitation. So during that period of time, I had become well known in IMO. I was elected the chairman of the Council of IMO, 
And I said to, to the political people that who had appointed me as the president of the Seaway, I would like to continue to be the chairman of the council if it's all right with you. I don't think it will inf interfere with my position as a, as a president of the Seaway. It's a, it's a rather independent organization, it's a, the Seaway. It's a crown corporation. At, and at that time, it had three appointed members. There was a president, a vice president, and a member. And uh, whoever the government wanted to put in that position, they put them in that position. A couple of them were always a political appointment. I was not. I was non-political. 1989, the then Secretary General, C.P. Srivastava, decided he did not want to continue as a Secretary General. He had 16 years in that position, was extremely successful, and was well respected by everyone. But he said to me, you should succeed me. And I said, well, CP, this is a, a choice of the membership. I'll have to be elected. And so on. he said, don't worry about that. So I stood for election, and I was elected in 1989 to take over in 1990, which meant that I had to move from Ottawa and relocate to London. I was elected as the Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations system a standalone organization uh, with, made up of members who elect to become members of the of IMO. And then uh, they collect enough money through uh, assessments on the membership to run it independently uh, from any other UN organization. So it's a standalone unit. But its main purpose, and it was it, it started really after the Titanic, because that's when people became aware that safety of, of life at sea was important. So ultimately that led to the need for an international organization to take on the load of looking after the regulatory regime for the safety of ships. And that's how IMO started. So the fundamental thing at that time that was the fundamental objective of IMO was safety of life at sea. That was subsequently added to by environmental issues. The exposure to an environmental disaster was quite high. So IMO had to move into establishing a regulatory regime to avoid pollution from ships. So that was basically what IMO was doing. When I arrived, I felt that the organization had been running very well, but that there was a change needed. That there was a change in atmosphere. IMO, in some circles, was considered to be a talking shop where they really didn't do anything. It took a long time to get things done. And there was no product at the end of the day that you would assign as being helpful that stemmed from IMO. So I th had views of trying to change this, bring the shipping industry closer to IMO, although the membership in IMO are member states, are governments, the industry had to become a part of this whole safety crusade we were on, if I can put it that way. So I tried to develop a rapport with the different shipping organizations, which I subsequently create, did. I simply was able to, I think, establish my position and the IMO's position as a, a place where shipmasters would want to come with their problems and not have them dealt with someplace else. The shipping industry is always facing some sort of challenge. Ship owners who have been successful have guessed properly and have got the right ships at the right time and in the right place. This forecasting is impossible to be 100% correct on. You're going to be wrong. You're just bound to be wrong. But we have to, to try and set that aside and say we will do the best we can to determine what the future needs are going to be. We know that shipping is going to continue as the cheapest and best way for moving goods around the world. There's no question of that. We're trying to make the vessels, the vehicles, more efficient. We're trying to meet the, the demands of the environmentalists and the demands of the financial people to keep this industry solid and on top of, of, of all of the uh, things that can be thrown at it. And, and guessing what the right things are 
is, is, is difficult. I think that we will see ships come to a maximum size. We've seen that in the oil industry where they built 500,000 ton ships, which were a disaster. And I think we're approaching that when it comes to 400,000 ton bulk carriers. And things like that are going to happen. We're going to reach an optimum position. We're going to reach a position where the crews will be rightly balanced with the size of the ships and the size of the responsibilities that are placed on those crews. We're going to have to take on board all of the technical developments that are here. We've gone through the, the for me, the introduction of television, the introduction of radio, when we used to sit around and look at, listen to the radio, the television, the advent of television, the advent of computers, the moves we're taking now where, where all of the uh, instruments we have to use, all of the handheld instruments that used to be Flash Gordon type things in the comic strips are here today. There's nothing to say that, say that that won't continue in the future. The thing is to make sure that we adapt our industry to those opportunities that are provided to us and we can handle the future. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's something to accept and to deal with. And, and, and that is where I think the shipping industry has to focus its attention and to be sure that it doesn't become a dinosaur.